Before I start, I do advise discretion as this video subject does involve murder, cannibalism, rape and extreme violence. Some people may find offence. If you feel you may be upset or offended, please go and watch one of my alternative videos, possibly for my Versus series. Let's begin. Introduction. This serial killer's killing spree started in 1978, ending in 1991 after the murder and sexual assaults of 17 known victims. He would roam the gay bars of Milwaukee looking for African American who he would lure back to his home with promises of money or alcohol. He'd lace their drinks with drugs before strangling them and having sex with their corpses, ending in the name the Milwaukee Strangler. Or Milwaukee Monster, today we look into the murderous life of Jeffrey Lionel Dammer. Early years. Jeffrey Dammer was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin on May 21, 1960 to Lionel and Joyce Dammer. He was described as an energetic and happy child until the age of four when surgery to correct a double hernia seemed to affect and change in the boy. Noticeably subdued, he became increasingly withdrawn following the birth of his younger brother and his family's frequent moves. By his early teens, he was disengaged, tense and largely friendless. Dama claims that his compulsions towards necrophilia and murder began around the age of 14, but it appears that the breakdown of his parents' marriage and their divorce a few years later may have been the catalyst for turning these thoughts into actions. By the time of his first killing, Dama's alcohol consumption had spun out of control. He had dropped out of Ohio State University after one quarter term and his recent remarried father insisted that he join the army. Dama enlisted in late December 1978 and he was posted to Germany shortly after. His drinking problems persisted and in early 1981 the army discharged him, although German authorities would later investigate possible connections between Dama and murders that took place in the area during that time. It is not believed that he took any more victims while serving in the armed forces. Following his discharge, Dama returned home to Ohio. An arrest later that year for disorderly conduct prompted his father to send Dama to live with his grandmother in Wisconsin. But his alcohol problems continued and he was arrested the following summer for indecent exposure. He was arrested once again in 1986 when two boys accused him of masturbating in front of them. He received a one-year prohibition sentence. Jeffrey Dammer's victims. Dammer murdered 17 men between 1978 and 1991. He was careful to select victims on the fringe of society, who were often interrogant and borderline criminal, making the disappearance less noticeable and reducing the likelihood of his capture. He led into his home, with promises of money or sex, he strangled them to death. He engaged in sex acts with their bodies and kept body parts and photos as souvenirs. First full victims. Damon's first murder occurred just after graduating high school in June 1978 when he picked up a hitchhiker named Stephen Hicks. He took him home to his parents' house. Damon proceeded to get the young man drunk. When Hicks tried to leave, Dama killed him by striking him in the head and strangled him with a dumbbell. Dama dismembered the corpse of his first victim, packed the body parts into a plastic bags and buried them behind his parents' home. He later exhumed the remains, crushing the bones with a sledgehammer and scattering them across a wooded ravine. It wasn't until September 1987 that Dama took his second victim, Stephen Tamoli. They checked into a hotel room and drank and Dama eventually woke to find him only dead. With no memory of his previous night's activities, he brought a large suitcase to transport Tammy's body to his grand grandmother's basement where he dismembered and masturbated on the corpse before disposing of the victims. It was at this time that the taxi man who came to pick him up asked if there was actually a body in the suitcase. Dama said yes. Only after Dammer's killed another two victims at his grandmother's home did she tire of her grandson's late nights and drunkenness. Although she had no knowledge of his other activities, she was forced to force him to move out of the premises in 1988. Sexual assault charges. That September 19, 
89, Dama had an extremely lucky escape. An encounter with a 13-year-old Latino boy resulted in charges of sexual exploitation and second-degree sexual assault by Dama. He pleaded guilty, claiming that the boy had appeared much older. While awaiting sentencing for his sexual assault case, Dama again put his grandmother's basement to gruesome use. In March 1989, he learned drugged, strangled, sodomized, photographed, dismembered, and disposed of Anthony Sears, an aspiring model. At his trial for child molestation in May 1989, Dama was a model of contradiction, arguing eloquently in his own defense about how he had seen the error of his ways, and that his arrest marked a turning point in his life. His defense counsel argued that he needed treatment, not incarnation, and the judge agreed, handing down a one-year prison sentence on day release, allowing Dama to work at his job during the day and return to prison at night, as well as a five-year prohibition sentence. Years later, in an interview with CNN, Lionel Dama stated that he wrote a letter to the court that issued the sentence requesting psychological help before his son's parole. However, Dama was granted an early release by the judge after serving only 10 months of his sentence. He briefly lived with his grandmother following his release during which time he does not appear to have added to his body count before moving back to his own apartment. Last 13 victims. Over the following two years, Dama's victim count accelerated, bringing his total from four to 17. He developed rituals as he progressed experimenting with chemical means of disposal and often consuming the flesh of his victims. Dama also attempted crude lobotomies, drilling into victim skulls whilst they were still alive, injecting them with muratic acid. On the 27th of May 1991, Dama's neighbour, Sandra Smith, called the police to report an Asian boy was running naked in the street. When the police arrived, the boy was incoherent and they accepted the word of Dama, a white man in a largely poor African-American community, that the boy with his 19-year-old lover, in fact the boy was 14 years old and the brother of the Latino teen Dama had molested three years earlier. Police escorted Dama and the boy home, clearly not wishing to become embroiled in a homosexual domestic disturbance. They took only a courtesy look around before leaving. Once the police left the scene, Dama killed the boy and proceeded with his sexual rituals and they conducted even a basic search. The police officers would have found the body of Dama's 12th victim, Tony Shoes. Before he was finally arrested, Dama killed four more men. The crime scene at Jeffrey Dama's arrest refrigerator and Polaroids. Dammer's killing spree ended when he was arrested on July 22, 1991. The body parts found in Dammer's refrigerator and Polaroid photographs of his victims became inevitably associated with his notorious killing spree. Milwaukee police officers were led to Dammer's when they picked up Tracy Edwards, a 32-year-old African-American man who was wandering the streets with handcuffs dangling from his wrist. They decided to investigate the man's claims that a weird dude had dragged and restrained him. They arrived at Dammer's apartment where he calmly offered to get the keys for the handcuffs. Edwards claimed that the knife Dammer had threatened him with was in the bedroom. When the officer went in to collaborate the story, he noticed Polaroid photos of dismembered bodies lying around. Dammer was subdued. By the officers. The subsequent searches revealed the head in a refrigerator, three more in the freezer, and a catalogue of other horrors, including preserved skulls, jars containing genitalia, and an extensive gallery of macabre Polaroid photographs of his victims. In 1996, following Dammer's death, a group of Milwaukee businessmen raised more than 400000 to purchase the items he used for his victims, including blades, saws, handcuffs, and a refrigerator to store body parts. They promptly destroyed them in an effort to distance the city from the horrors of Dammer's actions and the ensuing media circus surrounding his trial. Trial and imprisonment. Dammer's trial began in January 1992. Given that the majority of Dammer's victims were African Americans, they were considerably racial tensions. So strict security precautions were taken, including an eight-foot barrier of bulletproof glass 
that separated him from the gallery. The inclusion of only one African American on the jury provoked further unrest, but it was ultimately contained and short lived. Lionel Dama and his second wife attended the trial throughout. Dama initially pleaded not guilty to all charges, despite having confessed to the killings during police interrogation. He eventually changed his plea to guilty by virtue of insanity. His defence then offered a gruesome detail of his behaviour as proof that someone insane could commit such terrible acts. The jury chose to believe the prosecution's assertions that Dama was fully aware that his acts were evil and chose to commit them anyway. On February 15, 1992, they returned after approximately 10 hours deliberation to find him guilty, but sane on all accounts. He was sentenced to 15 consecutive life terms in prison, with a 16th term tracked on in May. Dama reportedly adjusted well to prison life. Although he was initially kept apart from the general population, he eventually convinced authorities to allow him to integrate more fully with the other inmates. He found religion in the form of books and photos sent to him by his father, and he was granted permission by the Columbia Correctional Institute to be baptised by the local pastor. His death. Dama was killed on November the 28th, 1994, by his fellow prison inmate Christopher Scarver. In accordance with his inclusion in regular work details, Dama was assigned to work with two other convicted murderers, Scarver and Jesse Anderson. After they had been left alone to complete their task, guards returned to find that Scarver had brutally beaten both men with a metal bar. From the prison weights room, Dama was pronounced dead after approximately one hour. Anderson succumbed to his injuries days later. In 2015, Scarver spoke to the New York Post about his reasons for killing Dama. Scarver alleged that he was disturbed not only by Dama's crimes, but by a habit Dama had developed by fashioning se severed limbs from prison fruit to antagonize other inmates. After being taunted by Dama and Anderson during their work details, Scarver said he confronted Dama about his crimes before beating the two men to death. He also claimed that prison guards allowed the murder to happen by leaving them alone. Jeffrey Dammer's House In August 2012, nearly two decades after his death, it was reported at Dammer's childhood home in Bath, Ohio, where he committed his first murder in 1978 and buried his victim's remains, was on the market. Its owner, musician Chris Butler, stated the property would make a great home as long as the buyer could get past the horror factor. In March 2016, Butler put the house up for rent for $8,000 per for the week of the Republican National Convention. As of 2017, the house was no longer listed on the market, according to Zillow.com. There have been some movies and books about Jeffrey Dahmer. Well-known books about Dahmer include Jeffrey Dahmer's Story, An American Nightmare by Ronald A. Davis. It was published just a few weeks after Dahmer's arrest in 1991. And also A Shrine of Jeffrey Dahmer by Brian Masters, which was published in 1993. Notable films on Dahmer's life and killing spree include Dahmer, a 2002 biographical film starring Jeremy Renner. The Jeffrey Dahmer Files in 2012 documentary covering the summer of Dahmer's 1991 arrest. My Friend Dahmer, a 1917 film about Dahmer's alcoholic pre-killing teenage years based on the 2012 graphic novel of the same name by Durf Backendurf. Now I'm not going to ask if you liked that story as it would be in bad taste. I'm trying to tell a story, not make these killers more notorious, but help let that victim's story be known. But please, if you found the series interesting, then please share and subscribe. Why not leave a comment? See you, pals.